I, well, I started out, uh, I was a teletype operator and uh, I started, we, we started out in a, in a, a, a mobile van the base, I mean, the base was under construction. It was a Thai Air Force base, uh, converting it to a military to a U.S. Air Force uh, installation. So there was a tremendous amount of construction and and building going on, and and uh, technology hadn't caught up with all of the you know all of the needs. So we were in a a mobile van with uh, sixty word per minute uh, teletype machines, uh, no air conditioning, uh, but then they shifted me over to the switchboard to uh to work in that phase of the of the of the project and it was kind of interesting i had worked on a switchboard before and this was the old plug and you know uh, uh dial uh, concept not anything like we got today but anyway they had what they did was they wired two switchboards together to make up <laughs> Instead of having a, a big switchboard, they had two wired together, and it was kind of awkward to operate that thing. But anyway, we uh, we got her done, and I was in that <clears throat> in that role for probably uh, a couple of months, not not too terribly long, and then I got shifted over to the combat control uh, comm center, communication center, where that really was the you know the heartbeat of the communications about uh, bombing runs and all of those things that came out of Saigon orders from headquarters for the pilots. So interacted quite a bit with the air crews as they come to pick up their orders and that sort of thing. And, you know, after repeatedly seeing uh, different guys, you sort of got to know them a little bit. And so uh, it was a, uh, it was an exciting time. Virtually every other message was a flash message, you know, they had different levels, but most of the, most messages were coming in as flash. Uh, what, what does that mean, flash? It means uh, handle it as fast as you can, get it to the addressee as fast as you can. Uh, don't, uh, you know, you don't throw it in a basket and wait for somebody to call. You call the addressee and get them to come immediately and pick up their communications. So this is 65. The Marines go into, into Da Nang, of course, that year, and things are beginning to heat up in Vietnam. What was, and then you said that um, this Thai air base was being converted for American use. What was the basic mission of the base at Ubon when you were there? Well, the basic mission was was flying uh, missions into North Vietnam uh, and into to Laos, basically uh, trying to intersect and destroy the Ho Chi Minh Trail to the extent that they could limit and if not stop the supplies coming out of North Vietnam into South Vietnam. So our guys were flying, you know, uh, at times up as far as almost uh, Hanoi. Uh, what I heard from them was uh, they were pretty frustrated with, uh, you know, with the missions in that they were, they were restricted as to, you know, what, what action they could take. They couldn't couldn't fire unless fired upon kind of stuff. And uh, they had to stay away from the ports. They couldn't do any bombing into the, into the ports because it was for fear they might hit a Russian or a Chinese vessel. So it was very frustrating for them. And we were, you know, we were losing guys pretty rapidly. Uh, uh, I, I, I know I was there when the first F-4 was hit by a surface to air missile. And that was a, you know that was really a, a downer for the, you know for the for the pilots and for the air crews because uh, the, you know the, it was described as just a ball of fire and no shoots and so those guys from that point on and to hear them describe what a uh, a Sam looks like it looked like a telephone pole coming at you is what uh, I heard a lot of them talk about. And the most the, dramatic thing for us was once we lost a pilot, then there had to be an after action report and that had to be sent back to uh, Saigon. And so, you know, I lost some, I lost, we lost some guys that I felt like I knew, you know, somebody would go out and, and uh, either get shot down and missing in action or uh, downed aircraft, with no, no shoots sighted and, and uh, most in most cases they listed them as is MIA, 
initially until uh, you know until later when they concluded that there wasn't one in likelihood that they survived. Were there ever um, rescue missions out of Ubon? So a plane is shut down, parachute is seen, and then are, do flights go out of Ubon also then to try to recover these pilots? Yes and no. Yes, and if it was within a, a reasonable distance, we had uh, rescue aircraft there, uh, helicopters. But most of the SARS missions were flown out of, uh, uh, I'm going to say uh, Top Lee, I'm not sure, but, but most of those, uh, because of proximity, they could get to the sites quicker than anything we had there. You mentioned um, these rules of engagement, and you have a, you have a recollection of hearing pilots talk about how these rules of engagement were discouraging to them? Yeah, you know, just uh, a lot of times uh, when the uh, when the pilot, and a lot, most of the time his co-pilot or, or uh, rear, his navigator, uh, would come to the comm center and they would be standing and, you know, and chit-chatting amongst themselves. And you, you can pick up on comments, you know, uh, that morale wasn't the best in the world. Let's just put it that way. That uh, I think the belief of the pilots and, and really uh, everyone over there was that it's kind of hard to win a war when you're fighting with one hand tied behind your back, you know, and I, it's hard for guys in the middle of combat to, uh, you know, to uh, deal with the political stuff going back home knowing that they're putting their lives on the line every day and knowing that they're going out there facing enemy fire when they really can't respond the way they would would like to respond and the way that they could respond. So I, I think that was the kind of thing that uh, these guys were. Uh, plus uh, the, the wing at that time really wasn't getting the help that, that it needed. Uh, equipment, uh, they had problems, uh, aircraft, they couldn't keep maintenance. Uh, uh, you know, it, it was just, it, it was at the start of everything. And as you can can imagine, when you're in the middle of a buildup, uh, you, you send aircraft out and it gets uh, shot, shot up and it comes back and you're trying to maintain it and you don't have the parts to maintain it. And yet and still you're getting these orders uh, to keep flying. And that, you know, just, just that kind of, uh, frustration on the part of the air crews. Do you remember yourself seeing some of the damage to the planes? Uh, not first, not up close. I mean, we, I was close enough. I, I could see uh, disabled aircraft. There were a couple that uh, would, had were, were shot up so bad that they were on the sidelines. They probably would never fly again. But as far as the day-to-day -day stuff, uh, that was restricted, the flight line was restricted area, so uh, you couldn't just arbitrarily go out in that area. Mm. Now, this is very early, 65, and then do you serve, you, your your year goes into 66, I'm assuming? Yes. So, but still, that's that's early in the war, and you're saying that, you know, one of the missions is to um, stop or at least severely hamper traffic on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Yes. And of course, you know, you talk to vets who were there in 1970 and still doing the same thing. Did exactly. you did you have a, a sense in your year there just sort of picking up things as you're hearing about what's going on? Were you already picking up a sense of an enemy that was very resourceful and just you know, despite everything brought that was brought to bear against this series of trails that we call the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they would just patch it up and keep going. I mean, did did you have a sense of that already? Exactly, exactly. I, you know, uh, just again listening to guys talk uh, in in the mess hall and places. You know, where we were uh, at the Airmen's Club or the uh, NCO Club. Guys talking about the ground crews, for example, uh, they, of course, listening to the pilots probably more closely than anything I might have heard. Uh, it was really frustrating because 
you, they go up and 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 destroy a bridge, <laughs> and then within no time at all, it was re you know refurbished and still still operating. Uh, so it you know, it, and and again going out day and night trying to, you know, trying to be effective, and yet and still the enemy was continuing to restructure and and uh, continue to get the supplies down the trail. So it was, uh, you know, it was a pretty frustrating uh, time, I think, for for the for the pilots particularly. So you worked is most of your tour. Then you're working in the Combat Control Communications Center, right? So just describe what a a typical um, period of duty is like in in that center. What are you What are you doing? What sorts of tasks do you have? Basically, managing. Uh, uh, teletype machines. Uh, you've got probably, I'm going to say, probably 10 teletype machines. Uh, if you can imagine a newsroom, constant communicate, constant uh, uh, traffic, and you're, you're, you've probably got a crew of maybe three or four uh, communications operators in there. Uh, grabbing those messages, determining where they need to go, who you need to contact. So it's 12 hour shifts, uh, rotating. Again, uh, you know, we understood that uh, you couldn't, you couldn't uh, linger on those messages because that could affect somebody's life. And, and so as soon as in, in the teletype machines, normal traffic would just, the machine would start running but if it was a high priority or a flash message, you would get five bells, ding, 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 ding. And when you heard that, you knew it was a flash message and you dropped whatever you were doing and, and grabbed that message, determined who was to get it, got on the horn and contacted the uh, uh, base ops and they would send uh, either the pilots themselves or someone in support to come pick that traffic up immediately. Now, when these messages come through, are you just reading something at the top that's, you know, that indicates who it's supposed to go to? Are you also reading or at least scanning the message itself? You didn't have time really to pay too much attention to the content. Your your function was was more get it, to, you know, it, this is a high priority item. Get it, you know, get it on to the next uh, spot where it needs to be. So uh, there wasn't there wasn't a lot of time for you to to get into the details, and in many cases it was coordinates and latitudes and that sort of thing that probably wouldn't mean a lot to uh, you know to someone who wasn't into that particular part of the process. And they'd go out in flights of four, uh, in a in a uh, unit, uh, four four F four Phantoms. And uh, and then they were coming and going when they they go out, sometimes be gone for several hours, and of course the process was when they left Uban before they went into enemy territory they would link up with a tanker and refuel before they went in on their combat run, and then coming off of the uh, bomb runs they would go back to the tanker refuel and 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 head back to Uban. And come back. On the occasions when um, a plane was hit and air crew was lost, what was the response on the base? Um, was there a pause? Was there a memorial service? Did things just carry on? Things just carried on. It was, like I said, in most instances, it was, uh, you know, viewed as a downed aircraft MIA missing in action. And there was this you know, this hope <laughs> that even if you didn't see shoots, that somehow they would they would have survived. And so I think everybody just was holding their breath, hoping that whomever was involved uh, was was not killed. Uh, perhaps they were captured, uh, but, you know, holding out hope and hope that they could be found. In the latter 70s and 80s there was a lot of um talk about you know american war veterans who are still 
held captive in Vietnam. And that was, you know, a, a big, you know, a big uh, discussion that took place and Senator McCain and Senator John mm -hmm. Kerry got involved in all of that. And, a, you know, a number of those pilots um, who were missing, of course, had flown out of Thailand. Mm -hmm. um, because of your experience in Yuban, um, did you find yourself at that period in those years after the war when the discussion turns back to, well, you know, maybe some of our pilots are still being held captive in Vietnam. Um, did you find yourself at that time paying a lot of attention to that discussion or the possibility of it? Oh, yeah. And and, and even even today, uh, I perk my ears perk up when uh, they find ha they have found the remains of some uh aircraft uh pilot or or backseater uh and i hear that that's happened it just immediately pops in my mind is that somebody that you know i knew of or uh perhaps uh encountered when i was at ubon yeah you bet the uh the thing i remember vividly was the day that the first mig was shot down by uh pilots out of Ubon. And I remember this because I was on my way to work. Actually, I was in the, in the chow hall in line uh, getting ready to, to eat before I went on duty. And the guys decided, you know, they were so, the, the F-4 pilots were so excited about uh, the fact that they had shot this MiG down that they decided to come in and Come, come in low and fast and do a barrel roll and then pull out uh, on the other end of the flight line. Now, whether they radioed in and got permission or not, mm. I don't know, but they did that. And what I remember was, I don't know if you've ever heard an, an F-4, uh, particularly when it's low and afterburners on, it is one loud piece of equipment. It scared the bejesus. We had trays going. <laughs> I think we all thought we we you know we'd been hit, uh, and yeah, obviously that uh, that's a, a memory that's pretty vivid. And I remember after leaving the the mess hall and getting on the we had a shuttle bus that took us from the mess hall out to the the comm center. Uh, I didn't hear the explosion, but what I saw was a plume of black smoke coming up uh, on the on the runway. And I later found out that, as I understand it, uh, there was a Thai pilot who observed the Air Force guys coming in, doing a barrel roll and going out. And he apparently tried to to mimic what they did. Unfortunately, uh, he pulled the stick the wrong way and augured into the runway, killed him, killed he and the, his uh, uh, passenger or, or, or co-pilot, if it was co-pilot, I'm not sure. But that's pretty well documented out there that uh, that that's what happened. But that's a, you know, that's a that's a memory that's pretty vivid in my mind. So your enlistment ends in 1966. Um, what, and so you come out of the Air Force. Now, still, that's fairly early. Um, and in terms of protests and things like that, there is some, but it, we're still a long way from the huge protests of 68, 69, 70. Um, how did your uh, return to the US go? Um, did you have any of these kinds of experiences you hear vets saying where, you know, there are confrontations of some sort with anti-war folks or any of this? No, thing? but in, when I got back to Travis <clears throat> and went through processing out, uh, even then, uh, uh, they advised us to, if we were, if we were processing out of the service, to uh, wear civilian clothes home. Uh, because of the protests that had occurred in various places, they just felt it would be, uh, you know, be less likely at, uh, to be 
accosted by somebody if you didn't have your uniform on. At the time, what impact did that have on you? You've just come back from serving a year overseas. Um, you know that a number of the crew members of, of these uh, planes haven't come home. Um, and now the Air Force is telling you to wear civilian clothes so that you don't have confrontations with these protesters, with these anti-war folks in the country. Um, what kind of impact did that have on you at the time? Well, obviously, it uh, it didn't make you feel very good. You know, uh, you spent four years of your life, a year of of living out of uh, not the not the best of quarters in hooches with no air conditioning, uh, mosquito nets, snakes, and and uh, and really, honestly speaking, the fear that uh, uh, that the base could be attacked, even though didn't happen while I was there. The, the potential was certainly there. Mm. And of course, uh, we didn't realize what was happening at the time, but they were spraying around the perimeter of the base with uh, a, with Agent Orange. Uh, fortunately, uh, my barracks was, I guess, enough away, away from the boundary that I don't think I was affected by it, but they are now honoring those who are having problems uh, honoring the VA is recognizing that they were ex potentially exposed to Agent Orange. But, you know, you know, I was, I was more anxious to get home and, and uh, get on with my life. So I didn't dwell on the uh, reception that much. When you're in a support role, uh, as, as a lot of us were, uh, you know, while you're not, being shot at every day, you're still an integral part of, of the story. And uh, I think that uh, in many instances, uh, you're not you're not recognized because you're not a headline maker. But if that mechanic didn't get his job done and the communications person didn't get their job done, none of those other parts could function. So it's it truly is a team effort.